Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to thenextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. I feel like I did that too in school, but I also feel like that was like 35 years ago. Yeah, but it's not like we were using Morse code in school either. I think it boils down to the fact that it's fun for kids and it's it's creating mental uh, word puzzles. I totally agree. I just think it's funny. My kids, you know what they don't do? Here's the, This is why it's funny and, and funny and sad because you know what my kids don't do in school? They don't have a typing class. Nowhere do they have they learned to type. Your kids learn to type? 
Well, no, but I didn't learn to type until junior high. I think eighth grade is when I had Well, let me class. tell you, I happen to have a child who has gone through middle school and no point did they make any effort to teach her to type. That is weird. I would think that that would be a requirement now. I it took is, it as an elective. I, I know. It is assumptive now. All those classes are gone because they assume by the time you get there that you know how to type. That's that, that's redonkulous. It is redonkulous. And yet here we are decoding Morse code. Hey, at least it's not a whole semester. Do you see? It. But do you see what uh, I mean? Do I you do. You see the do. the dark irony, the grim irony, the woe is our future irony. Yes. yes. I guess after the Pacific subduction zone hits, it won't matter. We're anyway. all gonna. We're <laughs> all gonna all need gonna to die. Yeah. Let's just tell the people where we're from, huh? Where are we from? is the next reel on rashpixel.fm everybody i'm pete wright and that over there is andy nelson hey 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 and we spoil movies tonight on the show the sweet relief that comes with the finale of our shane black series kiss kiss bang bang before we get into that you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app or even youtube and now you can join our email list connect with us on twitter or facebook at the next reel and Pull my finger, but not too hard, because it's time for the next reel's Instagram hashtag Pony Prize hashtag Guess the Movie Challenge. And with that, let's see if we can track down Games Master Stephen Smart, currently loitering at a Hollywood party trying to impress the ladies by making up fake careers for himself, and see if we can pull him away long enough to tell us who won. Hey guys, uh, this week we jumped back to the late 60s, uh, 1968 to be exact, with Rosemary's Baby, directed by Roman Polanski and starring Mia Farrow, John Cassavetes, and Ruth Gordon. Congrats to At Cotton Signs, who nailed it on Image One this week. You're entered once again into the 2016 Pony Prize hat. As always, a new challenge starts on Monday. So thanks, guys, and see you later. And we've got a blot spot. Friend of the show, Ben Lott, has written in with his opinion on the long kiss goodnight. I do enjoy the long kiss goodnight quite a lot. The cast is fabulous, and the action is tons of fun. I just have two problems with the movie. One, Charlie seems a little too intense and almost evil at first. For a long stretch of the movie, it feels like we've lost the protagonist. Two, late 90s green screen and CGI explosions look terrible. It sucks out all the excitement of an action sequence when you can tell the explosion is artificial. Your rank 120, my rank 80. I can agree with some of that. I I think he's got some valid points, although it's still... An awfully fun movie. Andy, it's time. Let's do trailers. So I'm going to go first. Okay. <laughs> so my trailer, I'm quite excited for because it's the return of Jason Bourne. And and uh, with Paul Greengrass at the helm, I've got to say, I'm really curious to see uh, where they go with this. They had uh, kind of left the franchise in the hands of our friend Jeremy Renner, who, you know, I think did a... Serviceable a, job. A serviceable job. I mean, I, th- I haven't rewatched that film. I did find it enjoyable enough, and it's something I probably would easily rewatch, but I haven't sought it out. But having Matt Damon coming back to play Jason Bourne again, um, he is going to be uh, trying to figure out a little bit more of who he is. Well, now that he knows who he is, he's trying to uncover kind of who he is, like the more of the hidden stuff in his past life. And uh, Julia Stiles figures in greatly. And uh, we've got uh, them meeting up in the trailer here as he kind of kicks off this search. And then, of course, Tommy Lee Jones figures into the story now as uh, kind of trying to track him. We've got Vincent Cassell in there and Alicia Vikander, which is uh, just a really fantastic cast. And uh, I'm super excited for this. It's got that gritty Paul Greengrass vibe all the way through. Matt Damon just looks ready to uh, tear things down. And uh, just, I mean, I love that franchise. We talked about that whole series before. And uh, I'm excited to bring this one up. We'll be talking about it with the film board in uh, July. So this is going to be a fun one. I really liked it. I I remember being... I don't know, peeved, I guess, when I started hearing these the interviews about how they were, you know, neither Paul nor uh, Matt were going to come back unless the other would come back. And then they got busy and then they couldn't figure out what the story was. 
I was disappointed that I that Born didn't take on more of a universe, you know? Like I yeah. I, I really liked the Jason Renner uh, entry into this and I hope Jeremy that, Renner? What you know, who cares? Don't be judgy. <laughs> I really liked Jeremy Renner's uh, a part uh, uh, entrance into the series, and I thought this was a great opportunity to to really take this kind of um, this CIA kind of underworld and and play with it with this whole you know we know there are other super soldiers you know <laughs> that had been created now and let's let's see what that universe looks like and and so I I like that Matt Damon's coming back I'm I'm excited about this movie I've liked all of the movies that they've done together uh, I think the cast looks great but you know I kind of hope that that this isn't the end because it could be the end you know what I mean yeah oh no it, it could be I what I'm really hoping what will really bother me is if they make this and act as if the born legacy yes. never happened. I think you just that, said it. That is exactly. Yeah. I sh- absolutely share that. That always uh, irks me. I, yeah. I feel, um, you know, the history is there with the films. Why not try to find a way and be creative and and tie things together? I mean, it would be it would be foolish of them, I think, to dismiss that chapter and the fact that these other people are out there. So I'm really uh, kind of looking forward to seeing how they do that and, you know, see if they can pull it off. The uh, poster, one of the posters, have you looked at the poster artwork? I've only seen like the main one just with his face, you know, his name. Yeah, yeah. The one where it's where he steps back and it's his body shot uh, is is just his head and then uh, the gun in light, and then you know his name is written over what you imagine is in shadow, like a black sweater or something like that. That was done by Concept Arts, and it is a very, very dramatic and cool poster. I am very impressed with it. It was a great choice. So awesome nice. use of, of Matt Damon's face. Excellent. There you go. When's it? When is it hitting again? This one's coming out uh, July 29th uh, here in the old US of A. It's going to start opening a little before that around the world, and it's going to spread all the way through October in Japan. So it's got a little bit of a, a wide release date around the world. But the bulk of it is going to be end of July, and we'll be talking about it on the film board, I think, right at the end of July, beginning of August. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Mine is uh, it's Woody Allen's next film. What do you th- what do you think? Are you were you excited to see this? Did this surprise you? That you picked it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just going to say this preemptively. Shut up, Andy. Uh, Woody Allen uh, has written and directed a new film, Cafe Society. It uh, stars, uh, stars uh, you know, all the popular young people, Kristen Stewart, Blake Lively, Anna Camp, Jesse Eisenberg, Corey Stoll, uh, and Steve Carell is uh, in, in this film as part of the A-list cast. Uh, it is the story of a young man arriving in Hollywood during the 1930s, hoping to work in the film industry, falls in love, and is swept up in the vibrant cafe society that defined the spirit of the age. This feels very much like the spiritual sequel to his last film, which I also very much liked, Midnight in Paris. Not quite his last film, but... No, it's right. He's actually done quite a bit uh, more than that. That's the last one that I uh, have acknowledged, uh, because he did... (laughs) That was like... When was that? It was like six years ago or something like that, right? a while ago, yeah. Uh, Because he's done... Oh, goodness. He's done a lot of film. Uh, To Rome with Love, Blue Jasmine, Magic in the Moonlight, Irrational Man, and He's got his annual output. His annual output. That's right. He's been very busy. And I can say, let me correct myself, this feels very much like the spiritual sequel to the last Woody Allen film that I saw, Midnight in Paris, and I very much like that film. I thought that was terrific, and I think uh, my hunch is that Jesse Eisenberg is is taking on the, uh, you know, the role of Woody Allen, hence played by Owen Wilson in that film. It just feels like a great pairing of uh, weird young Woody Allen with uh, a good young character actor. So I'm very much excited to see this. It celebrates an age, an era that I really like, and it is played uh, it, it such sort of frivolousness and fun, and uh, and it looks like a movie I think I'm going to enjoy. Why, why are you already a downer on it? I, you know, I don't know. It looks so kind of typical Woody Allen. I just find so much of his stuff um, now just kind of like, I mean, this annual output thing that he's got to do, I just feel like he's cranking stuff out and it doesn't uh, make it 
good. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just don't know. I, I missed Blue Jasmine. Um, you know, I, I know that Kate uh, Blanchett won her Oscar for that one, and I, I was curious to see that one. But I don't know. I, I feel like I feel like I can catch a Woody Allen movie every five or six years, and I'm okay. You know, I, I if if I went to try watching his entire body of work, all the you know 52 uh, credits he has as a director, I mean, I, that would just be exhausting. I, you know, so I, I kind of I kind of pick and choose with Woody Allen. This one looks like it could be okay. It's got the uh, the Hollywood vibe in it. Um, but, you know, he also did Hollywood ending, which uh, that Hollywood vibe was really kind of a curse for that film. So, but it's got a period thing. It's, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I'm curious about it. I just, I don't think I've been excited by a Woody Allen film. Since Scoop. In, uh, <laughs> since Scoop. Woohoo! <laughs> No, I don't know what the last time I was actually excited. I don't know if I've ever been excited. Maybe everyone says I love you because I thought that was such an original uh, take on things. But I, oh, I, I liked geez. his I liked his early to mid-90s output. That's kind of the period uh, that I liked. And then, you know, stuff in the late 70s, early 80s. Well, I think, A, you're too hard on Woody Allen uh, in terms of his work. Man, he needs... He's, there's lots of reasons to be hard on Woody Allen. Yes, I try uh-huh. not to think about most things in relation to Woody Allen because yeah. otherwise I just will never watch anything of his. Yeah, all right. Uh, no, I I really enjoyed Midnight in Paris. I thought that, for me, that was his redemptive film. And so I'm I'm actually excited about this. And I, I'm sort of disappointed in myself that I haven't been keeping up, uh, paying more attention to Woody Allen because I should have seen all of these other films, To Rome with Love, Blue Jasmine, Magic, Magic in the Moonlight, and Irrational Man 2. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to put those on the list before this one hits my screen and that is going to be august 12th 2016 in the usa which is actually uh late it hits in switzerland france uh switzerland and france in may may 11th may 19th at the seattle international film festival and then it opens wide august 12th in the u.s it's another one with a very wide release date we only have argentina sweden and brazil which comes out in october uh no idea when any when any other regions will see it Sorry. Hmm. Interesting. Andy, uh, I peed on the corpse. Can they do uh, ID from that? Let's go. Hurry up. It's not my fault. Just shut up and run. Hold it right there. Ah! Harry was a small time crook. Oh boy. Till he opened the door. Oh no, no, we're not ready for your audition. Just take him, he's ready. You ready, right? To a really big break. Quit acting like the good guy. You got your partner killed. You killed him. Ah! See, this is what I'm talking about. Old school method. Give me Gabe Perry on the phone. But he'll need a real cop. Detective lessons tomorrow for your acting. Oh, you're the uh, consultant. If he wants to act the part. You must be Gay Perry. Still gay? Me? No. I just like the name so much. I can't get rid of it. So what do you do? I'm a private detective. She thinks I'm a detective. Of all the idiot things to do. My sister... Are you going to help me? I got to check my schedule. Can you help me, Harry? Because you're not going to help me find somebody else. Sometimes I have other... uh, My caseload is is pretty... Thank you. From Shane Black, the creator of Lethal Weapon. Do not play detective. Moron. Go home before the bad guys do something bad to you. Ah! Two corpses in three hours. I mean, that's unusual, right? Yes. Comes a mystery. It's a frame-up. First things first. Do you have the corpse? I, I got rid of it. You threw it away. Yeah. Look up idiot in the dictionary. You know what you'll find? A picture of me? No. The definition of the word idiot. Ow. It starts with a kiss. Why'd you lie to me? It was an excuse to stay around you, so I mean, I think... Ow! Did I just cut off your finger? Yeah. It's on the floor. Pick it up. Pick it up. And ends with a bang. Where is the girl? Oh. You I mean, put a live round in that gun. Oh, well, yeah. There was like an 8% chance. Eight. Was Who taught you math? math? Robert Downey Jr. What do you think, I'm stupid? Val Kilmer. Yes, I think you're stupid. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Oh, hell. Kiss me. What? Kiss me. No, no, no. No, no, no. no. (laughs) These lessons suck. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang, Andy. This is the last film in our Shane Black series. This one written and directed by Mr. Black himself. Came out in 2005. Principal characters played by Robert Downey Jr., Val Kilmer, and Michelle Monaghan with Corbin Burnson as the beaver. What <laughs> What did you think about this film? I flippin' love this movie. <laughs> 
Yay! This is uh, just everything I love about uh, Shane Black. And I mean, it, I, I have some little issues with it, but they're they're minor. This movie, I think, is just so clever, so fun to watch. It's It, it plays with the conventions of storytelling. And uh, while also really doing a good job, I think, of kind of tackling kind of that private eye um, story, that that real pulpy, uh, you know, crime thriller type of story that you'd get in those kind of pulp novels back in the back in the day. And I think that Shane Black um, really, uh, because he's also directing the film, I think that there's this level of understanding that by nature, he kind of has with the way that he writes. And I think it really comes across in the way that he directs. And I really, really love that. So I adore this movie. And I am so relieved that uh, we've finally arrived uh, to this film. Because I think it is just, it's just so right, this movie. Everything about it is just fun. And uh, clearly they're having fun with it. They're having fun with the conceits of the of neo-noir and of these hard-boiled novels. They're having fun with the chapterization of the story. They're having fun with the timeline. Uh, it, everything about it is just fun. And even by the time, they've had so much fun with the film that by the time it resolves at the end, uh, I, I have no trouble playing, let's say, just kind of high, flying high and wide on the uh um, on, on the case itself. I, I just r- deeply enjoy this. I think every one of our principal characters in here is is super fun. And uh, the, uh, Val Kilmer and, um, and Robert Downey Jr. are great as the buddies. They're just great as the buddies. They're, they're the best pair of yes. buddies that we've had in any of these films. These guys, the relationship that they have together is just, uh, it just fits so nicely. Again, of course, you have the detective because there's always a detective of some sort in a Shane Black movie and it takes place at uh, Christmas time. And um, I, I think that um, there's this benefit to having a guy who's involved who's not a cop and and having Robert Downey Jr. as this this kind of crook who's sucked into the Hollywood acting scene and partnered with a detective to train him how to act like a detective, I think is a brilliant way to bring this pair together. I just, I, I love the uh, the personalities these two guys have and how Robert Downey Jr. as this guy, this character, Harry, coming from New York, is so disconnected from the way that L.A. works. And I think that taps in nicely with, with Perry, Gay Perry, who sees... Uh, the LA scene and sees these actors and uh, but he's a detective he's kind of half in the industry and half out and so he's able to kind of comment on it and then I, I think it's a great way to kind of present these two just as characters who who can step outside of the insanity that is LA and comment on it while they're in this story it's it's, it's just so fun and these guys work so well together in this film. I think one of the things that I like so much about it is is that it is a movie that that is uh, it lifts up on this pedestal the idea of of buddy masculinity and what they are striving for in uh, in these sort of masculine films and kind of shoots it down at the same time right it's this it's this ideal that it is it answers the call of this tougher presence of masculinity that can never be really reached and uh, and this is even according to Black to the point where he he talks about how um you know it's it's such a masculine worldview that at one point you know he has a character shooting another character by ejaculation right he has the gun in his crotch and he shoots <laughs> from out of his pants and and uh it is uh, that is very much uh that sort of you know that that italicized view of masculinity in cinema and i love that he plays so much with that with these characters they beat each other up uh they have just horrible things happen to one another they're tortured a little bit, but not that much. Most of the really bad stuff that happens to them is sort of of their own accord, <laughs> like accidental, and they're just kind of falling through it. Uh, but I want you to comment for me quickly on your take on Roger Ebert and his commentary here. Ebert gave this a two and a half stars out of four, and that makes me mad. He is such a dumbass on this one. And I actually found in the process, a uh, uh, there is actually a, a blog that catalogs Roger Ebert's worst reviews, and this one comes in at number 41. 
He says it's too cute for its own good, Ebert says. He compares it to Domino. He says it's better than Domino, or it's worse than Domino. Uh, contains a lot of comedy and invention, but doesn't much benefit from its clever style. What do you think of the Ebert in this case? I know that some people have a hard time dealing with uh, a really overt, in-your-face uh, style that comments on itself like this, that kind of meta filmmaking. Some people just don't click with it. So maybe Ebert just doesn't click with it, but he is a, a person who has seen lots of different types of films, and I would, th- I would have thought that he would have actually seen a lot of the creativity going on in this. I mean, it feels, yes, it feels like an action uh, Shane Black script, that kind of in the style of what he's done up to this point. But I think there's a lot of other stuff going on here. I think there's a lot of smarts. I think he's doing stuff in ways that are different and that are very much not just the, the shoot 'em up action movies. And I mean, I, I, I haven't seen Domino, but that's some, uh, another film that I think you or other people have told me it's worth looking at because totally. there's actually more going on in that film too. Oh, there, absolutely. So, even there if is. it is all jiggly monkey. Yes, but it doesn't touch Kiss Kiss Bang Bang in my opinion. It really doesn't. And, and no, so no, no. That's one of the things that really dis- you know disappointed me uh, when I caught that because he's not, he's not entirely alone. Alone, although it does seem like uh, critics are split. This uh, film was based, apparently, on Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Is that... It, did I re- catch that right? I've read it's very loosely based on that. Now, yeah. I don't I don't know <laughs> the story, but you've looked at it a little I, bit. I have, and I am telling you, I can't find it. <laughs> it's, it's so <laughs> loose, it may have been... Like, let's just say this is Brett Halliday's uh, book, uh, book five in his Mike Shane series, Bodies are where you find them might have been sitting near the desk on which this script was written as he was <laughs> writing it. Uh, but I, I can't actually see the connection to it, but it's it's in there. It's in the show notes if you want to link over to it. Um, uh, okay, so let's talk about the script. That is, that is uh, first w- where we have been talking, even though this was directed by Shane Black. Let's talk first about how this was uh, constructed. Uh, you know, I, I look at this, like you said, this was the best pairing of uh, buddies— uh, of any of the films that we have we have touched so far, Shane Black has uh, you know he, he's done that so much in all of his films. You've, you've got Riggs and Murtaugh. You've you've got uh, Hallen Beck and Jimmy Dix yep. in Last Boy Scout. You've got uh, uh, Charlie and Mitch in Long Kiss Goodnight. Right. I mean, even going to the last action hero, you know, with the uh, with the kid and uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Um, Jack Slater. And uh, whatever the kid's name is, um, I think that he really enjoys having pairs of people because they can play off each other well. And I think you found something talking about how he really pulls from, you know, like he loves the buddy sort of stuff, buddy narratives. He pulls from Walter Hill, William Goldman. You know, he, Butch Cassidy is one of his favorites. I, I, I think that there's something the nature of two uh, people kind of as pals who are going through something together allows for really great opportunities for dialogue you know you have and and this is a guy who i think is not just smart i mean most of the stuff that i read in the scripts is the is the uh, action lines it's what's happening the way that he writes i think is so clever but you also have to look at the dialogue that he brings and the stuff that he has these people say to each other i think is just so sharp and really uh, clever and it sounds real even though it's not real but it just sounds real and it sounds it's it's the sort of dialogue that always is like what you wish that you could think uh, think of at the moment you know those really great quippy lines that i think is is what i like so much about black when he's in his element 100% and this film captures that it is uh, this is the film that is written with lines that i thought of just 10 seconds too late in my life, right? If you could just write a script like that, every yep. time I was mad or frustrated or whatever, that line that comes to my head ten seconds too late—that's what this movie feels like to me. That's the same level of satisfaction I get. He um, he says that uh, you know, in his own words, this is in an interview I I caught with him at the um, it was it just I, either before or after the Toronto Film Festival. He said uh, that um, to your point that writing dialogue, and this was an answer to the question uh, where. 
where do you get your uh, your inspired insult dialogue when when buddies are talking to one another and they're insulting one another you know one way or another how does that come to you and and you know talking about goldman and hill and butch cassidy how these characters work but but it was this nature of saying that that you know writing naturally there's nothing more frustrating than a new writer that sits down and tries to write dialogue naturally because it's the most boring dialogue ever um, you know, it's, oh, you know, you want to cross the street? Yeah, let's cross the street. Okay, we should cross now because the light's red, you know, and that that kind of stuff that he says, I read scripts and, and that kind of stuff comes out. What you the, the real goal as a writer is to find a way to write movie dialogue that doesn't actually sound like movie dialogue, that puts it in these in these actors' hands in such a way that they can make movie lines sound natural that's what natural really is and i think this film demonstrates that in spades um how does this script i mean you you uh, I, I, did you get through the entire script no i, I got through about uh, two-thirds of this one um uh, lots of great stuff in it. and again it's just got that fun voice and everything yeah i was going to read a sample please um this is uh, right after he uh, after pink hair gets shot and when he's hiding under her bed uh she gets shot by uh, who is it? Mr. Uh, Mr. Fire shoots her. Her eyes inches from his, the two of them close as lovers, and Harry panics, reacts instinctively, jams a finger to her lips, cuts her off, withdraws it, presses it to his own lips, eyes pleading with her, please, oh please be quiet. Her mouth works soundlessly, the light behind her eyes dimming. She looks to him, afraid, imploring. Her, he wills her silent. That's right, honey, just for the next few seconds, good girl. Seconds are all she has. She passes them in pain. And then, obediently silent, she dies. The lights go out. Her breath escapes. Harry, having denied her a single word, this will haunt him for as long as he chooses to live. He shifts his attention, watches the tailored slacks exit the room. Hears something plunk on the dresser top. Harry peeks his head out, looks to the dresser. There, sitting all by its lonesome, a silenced automatic. The son of a bitch left his gun. Harry breaks cover, climbs to his feet, crosses to the dresser. An automaton calmly claims the gun, checks the safety, flicks it off, turns, hearing footsteps approach, grits his teeth, bides his time. Mr. Fire doesn't see him at first, appears in the doorway, putting on gloves, blanket over his shoulder. Then he does see Harry. Guy's a pro, gotta give it to him. A flicker of reaction, that's all. Mr. Fire, hey, you still around, tough guy? Got a gun, I see. Damn, you are tough. Harry double taps, ba-bam, puts two in his gut. Fire regards him in stunned disbelief, looks down, sees red. Harry pauses, adjusts, adjusting his aim. Then he just keeps pulling the trigger, burning new holes, shot after shot. The guy jitters, perforated, flops against the stair rail, overbalances, legs yanked up and over, plummets, slams a glass coffee table, explodes it, bounces once, hits, dead. Harry, the executioner. Lots of great stuff going on here. Uh, I mean, I love the bit when you've got that moment where you see Harry having denied her a single word. This will haunt him for as long as he chooses to live. A great little moment we have there as as Pink Hair dies and he has to keep her quiet so that he doesn't get killed. And then just, just the way that all of this plays out. Now, I picked this particular scene because... What I love about the script is he becomes this executioner here. But what I love about what Shane Black and and Robert Downey Jr. ended up doing in the execution of this when they actually filmed it is that they they modified it a little bit. And and you get that as Robert Downey Jr. Uh, he does kill Mr. Fire, but it's it's not as an executioner. I mean, yes, he does execute him, but he does it in this way where he almost is unwilling to kind of accept what he's doing and every time he goes to shoot at at Mr. Fire he looks away from him and he won't actually look at the guy as he's shooting him and I found that such an interesting character choice for him to make as he's doing that because this is a guy who's never killed anybody I mean yes he's committed crimes but killing people has never been his thing and here he has to do it because he just witnessed this guy kill this this young girl who's just innocently got herself into this mess and the way he does it I just think I think that the script is really strongly written. It's done really well. But then I think that they made the right choices in the way that they actually directed and acted the scene. I absolutely agree. This is a sequence that really celebrates how to be so true to the character. And, and it just it just feels right. How did this film, this was after his, the script comes after his, you know, what was it, nearly 10-year hiatus? 
Yeah, he, uh, I mean, he said in, uh, he has a quote in this wonderful Vanity Fair article that kind of talks about the spec market and how uh, really, <laughs> largely due to him, and all of these uh, these ridiculously overpriced sales of scripts, it really kind of killed the spec market and really ended up changing the writing industry in Hollywood and, and kind of brought a grinding halt to the way things were done, shifted things in a way that people complain about now, but, you know, this is the system that's now been created because of it. But, yeah, he, he said, cut ahead to 2001 when I finished a script for something called Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and all of a sudden, not only is it not read in the office while we run a clock on you, it was, I submit Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, and maybe in a week or two they get back to me. Suddenly, I had no power. This was a guy who really kind of lost everything that he had. I mean, when, you know, people kind of looked at him as the guy that killed the spec market and, you know, this overpriced writer who couldn't deliver on the project product. And he really had to kind of almost start from scratch again and kind of beg his way back to the table. He says in a, uh, again, in this uh, wonderful interview uh, with a class of screenwriters, he says, you know, um, the, the story of his return to get Kiss Kiss Bang Bang made uh, is a story of him going to Joel Silver eventually. And he said, I want you to think about that scene in Boogie Nights when Dirk goes crawling back to Jack Horner with, with all that same begging and hugging, but a lot less crying. Uh, he says that's what it was like. I had to go back and 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 beg to for for support to get this thing done, um, and it ultimately ended up getting produced by by Silver and uh, um, Silver Pictures, so Silver and Susan Downey. Yeah, Susan Levitt at the time. Susan Levitt at the time, right? Um, who who met Robert Downey Jr. on the film? On this film, yeah. And now she is the president of Team Downey, their production company uh, that uh, she and and Downey run together. But uh, the production, again, to your point, was canceled three times before the first shoot day, the third time just seven days before they were due on location. So this was a really difficult film to get produced, particularly, I think, with him in the director's role. Well, and it only cost $15 million to uh, make this film. And looking at what uh... Uh, you know, the previous films all cost. I mean, this is just a pittance, really. And I mean, right. I, I, you can't find anything as far as what he actually got paid for this script. But everything I said, well, it's it was definitely a lot less than uh, what he's been paid in the past. And I mean, he even jokes that, you know, he was paid scale on this one. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised. It feels like, though, even at that rate, everybody had to take a take a pass on this film. Like this is this certainly isn't Robert Downey Jr. money, although he wasn't in Robert Downey Jr. money class at that time, or even Val Kilmer money. Well, yeah, I mean, both of them were in a place where, I mean, Robert Downey Jr., I mean, remember, 96 to 2001 is really when he was having a lot of his drug problems. Exactly. Um, he, he finally came out in 2003 uh, clean and sober and had to really kind of start rebuilding his career. I mean, I think it was 97, he got fired from Ally McBeal. Yeah. Just uh, I, somewhere in there is when he kind of wandered into that apartment and you know, randomly yeah. was laid down <laughs> in some right. stranger's bed. Uh, just lots of problems. And so he was in a place where he was, uh, I mean, he was doing good projects and stuff, but he really was in a, a tough time in his own career. And so this, I mean, people so uh, are so used to him as Iron Man and kind of this this mega mogul movie star that he has since become since uh, since the first Iron Man came out shortly after this film. Um, but they forget about kind of where he was before that. And and this film, I think it was a, it was a, a fight to get Robert Downey Jr. into it, too. So it was, a, you know, I think he was a perfect choice for the character. And I, I, I loved that they kind of fought to get him in here. And Val Kilmer, I mean, he was um, I, I think he was doing OK, but I don't think I mean, he kind of had his bigger stride in the in the 90s. And then I think he kind of tapered off uh, doing a lot of stuff that uh, wasn't quite as big. I mean, I think this uh, 2006, he also did or right after this, he did Deja Vu um, Mm -hmm. as an agent in that film. He'd gone from kind of the leading man to kind of a supporting character by that point. And Michelle Monaghan was very new. Yeah, she was really new. I think I think it was shortly after this, she ended up in Mission Impossible 3. Yeah which kind of helped boost her up a little bit. But yeah, she hadn't done a whole lot before this. Well, it is uh, it, it came together really well. So transitioning to Shane Black as a director, right, taking these cues from, from noir, 
uh, in, in creating this film, obviously on a shoestring. Um, you know, what's your sense of, of his work in the director's chair? He is a guy who feels like he's been directing a lot longer. I mean, it could just be his time in Hollywood and, and being on sets and being around big films. But the film, even even for a $15 million budget, it feels pretty big. It feels like the, that he has a, a solid sense of how to tell the story in the right way. And I think that he he worked with his team. If you watch closely to the film, there's a good number of of uh, scenes where the whole scene takes place in like one shot, maybe two shots. And I, I think that they worked well to kind of do that so that they could kind of move through it faster. I think that he uh, acknowledges that with the money they had, there were some shortcuts they ha- that he had to make, some stuff that he didn't like as much, um, like some of the stuff in the conversations of people in the car, and he wishes that he could have shot them in different ways. But, you know, when you're up against the clock, you're up against the clock, and you just you have to do what you got to do to get get your get your shots and move on. I don't think that shows when you watch the film. It feels from a an audience perspective that this is an assured director who knows how to tell the story in the way that works best for the story. I think so too. I think it's really funny your comment that it feels like he's been directing a lot longer than he has. This so this was obviously his first film as a director. His second film as a director was Iron Man three. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's so a leap. Pretty man. pretty assured. <laughs> that is uh, that is a leap. And uh, look at his next three projects. Doc Savage is a superhero movie um, a, that is strangely a crossover hero between DC and Marvel. Uh, it has just been announced, no date. But the nice guys, we are both, I think, deeply excited about this movie. Oh yeah! And of course, in 2018, the Predator, you'll never see him coming. I think we're excited about this too. I'm excited about everything. I, you know, I think that something happened to Shane Black. Uh, I mean, Iron Man three. I just rewatched it too as part of this whole thing, trying to just get a sense of of him and. I really enjoy the movie. Um, it's not my favorite of the Marvel movies, but it still is fun. And I think that he does a good job in that world. What I think's happened to him is, I think, and this is all just speculation, of course, but I feel like that that big break that he had of trying to kind of refigure himself out gave him the opportunity to reshape his career into a, into a, a writer-director. And I think what that is giving him is the opportunity to... Uh, to kind of be a little bit more um, uh, the type of person who gets to pick what he's going to do now. And and um, as somebody who has had such success, I think that uh, I, from what I see, the, the choices that he's making, I think he's doing a, a bang-up job. I think so, too. So let's uh, let's talk more about the cast. Uh, we've talked, have we talked enough about uh, Robert Downey and, and Val Kilmer? Do you have more to say? Uh, no, just I think that they're perfect in the roles. They're yeah. fantastic. I think they really are. And and of course, Robert Downey Jr. has uh, the corner on playing this lovable idiot, right? And that's that's kind of a hard a hard character to play. Uh, and, and I'm doing him a disservice. He's not an idiot. He exists in that space where he is absolutely competent in his own universe. As a thief, where, where we first meet him, he's he's actually, it sounds like he's stealing a present for uh for, uh, for a niece a, a niece right a, a young girl and and uh, he's in a toy store late at night and stealing these things but he's on his cell phone to her asking her what she wants and and it's wonderfully comic the alarm goes off and he has to run um now we get the fact the 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 feeling that he is in his universe he is maybe not the very top of his game but he's certainly you know doing well it is when he is he moves into this fish out of water area where he he goes runs upstairs and he turns out he bursts in on an audition and he's auditioning for the role of a repentant criminal and he happens to be hiding from the police and he delivers a role uh, that that gets him noticed by this by the uh, the casting agent and thus begins his his story and once we get him in that fish out of water area he ends up existing perfectly in the I almost am going to lose control um, because I just I, I don't know which end is up and I think I can stay up on my feet like he has some horrible things happen to him horrible things happen to him and yet he keeps moving forward and I think that's a real testament to Robert Downey Jr. Uh, you know being able to maintain a character that is um, fun to look at while all of this craziness is going on and you know what else he's really good at hmm 
playing a character that um, narrates and breaks the fourth wall constantly. What do you think of the narration in this? I, I it's it's so much fun. I mean, this ties into kind of that that sense that Shane Black has in his scripts. It really kind of maybe for the first time comes through in the in the actual film itself. And I, I feel so much of that Shane Blackness um, as I watch this, the way that the film stops and he's commenting on it. And he's, you know, even even he, how he has that happy ending and then mocks the happy ending <laughs> with all the <laughs> right. Abraham Lincoln's walking and all the dead people, you know, <laughs> it's just... <laughs> It's it's, he, it's he's having fun, and I love that he's just having just sheer joy with the the art of making a fun movie. I think that's a really great point, and I hadn't made that connection. But when you look at it that way, uh, in in the spirit of you know the voice of all these characters is the voice of some part of the writer, right? And if and and you know that's it, it's sort of inescapable that that that's just something that happens in the writing process. Uh, but there is the you know his protagonist. Black's protagonist is Robert Downey Jr. in this movie. I feel very much like I could just as easily see Shane Black, you know, f- getting his finger cut off and and you know st- waking up in the in the house, uh, you know, and having to hide under the bed. Like that, that just very much feels like a personal story right. to me. Okay, Val Kilmer uh, as Gay Perry, so much wit. It is just a, a really great character for him, and possibly his last great character. I'm not sure what he's done since then uh, that's uh, that's really worth talking about. What did he do? We talked about him a long time ago. We talked about Twixt, that Francis Ford Coppola movie. When? Wh- that was, what, 2012? That was 11. 2011. Was that the... That was Fat Val Kilmer, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's lost a lot of weight. Has he? I think he, he put it on and then he, he was able to shed it he's getting ready for top gun too i guess yeah i mean if you're gonna hit the volleyball court you know he's he's an actor that i've always liked um he's an actor that i always hear stories about and i kind of wonder if he's just and then listening to the audio commentary for this he really kind of comes across as kind of that that crazy actor that being said there is something that is is kind of captivating about him and i think when he's in the right role i think he really shines you look at something like heat you look at something like tombstone uh, even his tiny part in True Romance or The Doors. I mean, he's he's done some just fantastic stuff. Um, but then he's you know got in trouble with some stuff like The Island of Doctor Moreau and The Saint. So I wanted yeah. more of The Saint. Yeah, it it could have been a whole thing. They could have yeah. if they if they did that right, it could have turned into a whole franchise. He did. Uh, you know. You know. Uh, he was on Knight Rider. Did you watch the uh, the return of Knight Rider? It wasn't the return. It was just the the reboot of Knight Rider. I didn't. The Knight Rider, it turns out, Kit became, was the Knight Industries 3000. Oh. Uh-huh. I think you know where I'm going. And he was a Mustang, a black Mustang. Of course he was. And the voice was Val Kilmer. Oh, nice. Right? Interesting. Instead of... Uh, William Daniels? Yeah, William Daniels. That's right. So Val Kilmer and William Daniels. Interesting. All right. I'm done, I'm done talking about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Michelle Monaghan. I love her. Hard not to. Yes. I. Where did I first see her? I want to say it was in... Uh, You're talking about where she was, where you first saw her or where she did, was what first, did I first seen? What did I first see her okay. in? Okay. She was in the Born Supremacy, so I yeah. guess I saw her in that, and Constantine, and this, and Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and North Country. Gosh, I everything that she was in, like it, it was a big run. I saw pretty much everything. Yeah, and it was a huge three gone, run right in, uh, yes, right in a row. Uh, she was, she's been in a ton of stuff. She's in Patriot's Day. Yes. Kudos to uh, the project that uh, Michael Coffey's working on. That's right, right that's right. She's not as much of that sort of noir femme fatale, you know, as the film hints that its homage is pulling from. It's she she definitely doesn't fit quite that role. No, and that is an interesting point that, you know, in this whole uh kind of search to tell a story that is very much kind of a, a noirish, pulpy detective crime thriller, that our leading lady is not 
uh, does not end up being a femme fatale. And it's interesting that he chose to do that. I wonder why, because it would have made sense to do that. And I wonder if it's just because he wanted to kind of have that love story there. I mean, I, I really love the love story. I love the relationship between Harmony and Harry. I think it's it's just perfect. But there is none of that sort of that seedy, seething kind of betrayal. Yeah, uh, it, he's the one who betrays her, at least, you know, the he doesn't. Uh, but, well, I guess he sort of does right in the beginning. But it, it it's he's the one who's the betrayer. She is the she's really the client. Uh, and, and so if, if anything is missing, we don't we don't get enough of the dark side of her. It, yeah. And I'm, I'm torn. Like, would I have liked more of that in here? And I, I, I kind of just feel the film works the way it is. Yeah. But it does make me question. You know, I, it does make me want to know what that would have been like. Yeah. No, the, the more we talk about it, the more I think I would have been mad. She's <laughs> right. so, she, if, if that was the case, she's not the right actress to, to have played it. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, she is the perfect amount of just sort of innocence and, um, and enthusiasm for her, you know, her budding career and for the case that they're all working on. Like, she's just having too much fun with it um, to be a, a source of betrayal. Right. Corbin Burnson. Holy cow! His uh, his filmography is two hundred and eight credits as an actor. Yeah, it is full. Let's just say, even popping up in The Young and the Restless recently. Wow! Yeah, he is all over the place. Look at him. He's an actor, though. Like, I guess I just don't bump into him in projects that I'm watching that much. But there was this, and then before this, I think it was probably L.A. Law. That that's right. Uh, you know that I really kind of remember him. And, uh, you know, and then I go back to films that I was watching in the uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, like Major League, Disorganized Crime, uh, like Hello Again, those sorts of things. So uh, how does he work for you in this? In this case, what does he play in this film? I mean, he is the the former actor turned entrepreneur who owns like a, a big hospital. I uh, I think he works here, um, but I think Shane Black even says, you know, I, I spend so much time developing my the buddies in my movies that by the time I get to the bad guy, I feel like I don't end up giving them enough uh, enough time to really fully flesh their characters out. And that definitely is true here. I think that his character works as far as fitting into the story, but I don't think there's a whole lot of interesting stuff about it. My sense is that part of the reason that the character fails is because the only time that we learn anything of substance about the character is in the mouths of our protagonists, right? It's them talking about him and about his relationship with the daughter. He's never allowed to really flesh himself out on screen. Um, You know, we see him at the party in the beginning, then we see him in clips on TV, and then we see henchmen, and then he's the bad guy. Yeah, and we see him in as they're discussing the case, like acting out kind of right. what they're talking about. So, right. Uh, so I, you know, I, I don't know, I, I don't know that that's necessarily a, a critique on the way they do this. I mean, there are a lot of characters that that are built up in the mouths of of the protagonists that actually turn out to be interesting characters. But in this case, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't actually work for me. Uh, and it it ends up being sort of an empty shell. As much as I actually like Corbin Burnson, like I I think he's a fun character. I mean, we've we've actually talked about him obviously before on this show in Major League. He's a good all around utility player, but I think the the character itself is underwritten here. I would have liked to see more with him. I mean, I still enjoy seeing him in the role. I just wish there was more. Yeah, I you know I put Rockmund Dunbar in here. Yep, Mister Fire. I liked, uh, I I think that the pairing actually between uh, these two guys, uh, him and Dash Myhawk as Mr. Frying Pan, yeah. I, I actually thought that they were a great pair. Um, I don't know if I have much to say about them, but I did really like the two of them. He is a, a classy dude, Rockman Dunbar. Yeah. Uh, I really... Uh, I, I really like him. I I didn't um, I, I didn't know much from him until I realized that I watched you know forty episodes of Prison Break with him in it, and uh, he's fantastic. Like he's just great on, on a show that is ultimately talk about pulp. And then I realize he shows up everywhere. He shows up everywhere. And then to see him in Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, I thought was really fantastic. I think it's great that he's in it. I think he plays a. Uh, you're right. The pairing between him and and um, the frying pan are 
is is just wonderful as as the henchman I really liked him and I I actually liked one of the things that stood out to me is that you know when he dies he dies kind of outside of the rest of the action right he's at he's at home or he's at somebody else's home was well, right? at the girl's house he's at the girl's house right but he doesn't have his partner there he's just he's kind of you know it's like he he's caught in the bathroom you yeah, know what I mean? Like a Pulp Fiction death. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. It's a Pulp Fiction death. It's Travolta's Pulp Fiction death. So right. I, I like that a lot. He certainly does a lot of TV. I'm just looking through his filmography. He's yeah. very busy in the world of TV. Right. But he is, he's is he got a great presence. I really enjoy him. And Dash Myhawk's been in... Uh, he's just one of those familiar faces you see in things like Thin Red Line, I Am Legend, Silver Linings Playbook, Day After Tomorrow... He is yeah. definitely one of those faces. I put uh, Indio Falconer Downey in here because I think it's so cute that Robert Downey Jr.'s son played young Harry Lockhart. Isn't that cute? Oh, I thought it was cute. That's all I had to say. Yeah. He's in a band called The Seams. <laughs> and then you had one more uh, special credit. The bear, the Gennaro's bear from the beer commercial that uh, Michelle Monaghan acts in. The voice of the bear, what do I know? I'm a bear. I eat the heads off fish. <laughs> it's Lawrence Fishburne. <laughs> and a little cameo from his, uh, I guess, his friendship with Joel Silver. They managed to kind of pull him in to do that. So that's I awesome. think that's really funny. Such a weird commercial. I don't know what, what I would think if I actually saw that as a beer commercial. I know. It's a would terrible I drink com- Camaros? <laughs> Probably terrible not. Terrible commercial. <laughs> Uh, it, a little bit more on the production. The cinematography is done by Michael Barrett. You know, you talk about this film at the intersection of comedy and crime. Michael Barrett is has done films. Like, this is the film that brought his two, like, genres together. He has done a lot of comedy and crime, and the comedy is not always great. Um, no. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Really not. Um, and so uh, this, I, I don't know, I actually really enjoyed uh, the camera on this film. I enjoyed the camera and the, the you know, the lighting choices. I think he really captured uh, a sense of, of modern noir here. And I think he did a great job. It wasn't quite as adventurous as, as some other, you know, directors who are experimenting here. But this coming off of a very Harold and Kumar 3D Christmas and Ted and... Uh, you know, about last night and a million day- ways to die in the West. I mean, uh, I don't know what I, I would have expected, but I, I feel like I got more out of this film uh, than those. Oh, yeah. Uh, although I, I will say at times it feels, it does feel lit like a Hollywood film would look, but I still think that it worked well for the for the content. Production design, I only wanted to bring up one note Production and art design in particular, I think Aaron Osborne is behind production design. And what I really liked about it is when you look at the books that this film was based on, when they hold up the the books in the in the film, you know, because the, the whole movie is about kind of following the the detective here of these books in the in the film. And the book art has been designed essentially to mimic the original art of the books in real life. Yeah, like the like the actual uh, the uh, Brett Halliday books. Yeah, the Brett yeah. Halliday books, yeah. And so in that regard, this film is based on the Brett Halliday book. That's Which about it. The cover. That's it. it is exactly <laughs> the cover of the book. That's like so that. funny. Yeah. And, and the titles, too. Titles. Danny Yount's title design. Love that. I love the titles. They're very clever titles. I thought they were really fun. They tell a nice story and uh, and are worth uh, worth noting, the titles. They're fun. It's a fun animation sequence. We need more like that. We really do. Uh, uh, final visual effects. Uh, uh, the only visual effect that I uh, just fell in love disgust with is the finger. Uh, oh, my gosh. The finger plays such a central role in this film and uh, and in uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s uh, portrayal of this character because much of the film, he's dealing with the fact that his finger was closed in the door by Michelle Monaghan. A door slam. She slammed a door on his finger and chopped it off, but didn't just chop the tip off. She chopped off like to the second knuckle. So he had it uh, sewn back on. They they caught it and had it sewn back on, and then it was ripped off again. And then a dog ate it, and it's just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> the whole round of his finger. But one of the things you noticed that I felt was very noir is it felt like he didn't really feel pain. Like I would have been. Uh, well, he was dumped up. He does talk about how that's true. He's he very, is very hopped up, and then he passed out in the car for hours. So, right. uh, in any case, I, I just really thought the effect was great, and it was just a nice little bit of makeup that uh, that I thought looked uh, just really appropriately disgusting. 
and something that I think is worth noting is, you know, that uh, Black pulled from a lot of the crime thrillers is that so often your protagonist gets injured in some way, whether it's, you know, a nose sliced like in Chinatown or a finger getting cut off or whatever it is. I think that's kind of a, a great kind of uh, story element to build in. And I'm glad to see that he kind of continued that tradition here. I, you know, Jim Page uh, did the edit, and this is another one where it's just like at the confluence of comedy and crime. And I, I would call this, particularly the first act, a challenging edit because there's a lot going on underneath this voiceover in the first sequence, the first like two chapters, three chapters, you know, as they do the title interstitials. Uh, there's a lot going on, and we're having to keep up with this essentially unreliable narrator of Robert Downey Jr. just because he's so scattered. And to keep up with the, how the, the film works on screen, sort of visually, I think it works really well. I think it's, uh, I think he did a, a solid job, and I think it's, um, I think it ends up being a really nice package. It's very tricky, uh, especially when the story actually stops. And I mean, he's actually commenting on, oh, I forgot I was supposed to mention that thing. And a lot of those sorts of errors are built into the actual way the story is being told. And so as an editor, you have to, I think, be really uh, cognizant of that and make sure you're telling it in the right way, especially because that lends to the comedy. You really need to have that in there. Uh, Do you have the score? You know, I don't. This is one that I, I, I need to hunt down and see if I can track down. I don't know if it was ever released. Apparently it was in 2005, but I could not find it. I couldn't mm. find it anywhere to stream or buy digitally, and uh, I haven't seen haven't seen it. The score is uh, by John Ottman, and as I listened through the film the, the second time this evening, uh, I really like it, and I think he, he plays great homage to those, you know, with those great Ottman horns and use of piano, and it fits, it, it really modernizes the noir vibe, and I think he did a great job with it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. You've just, you've been a little quiet, and I think it's because you want to go to your favorite site. The guns, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's what I really live for. Is what the I IMFDB, IMFDB Internet Movie Firearms Database. <laughs> have you been researching ahead at all? Because I'm looking forward to Fritz Lang's uh, <laughs> additions to the Internet Movie Firearms to Database. See what we can pull from. Yes, those. yes. Uh, uh, I'll I'll have to see. I'll have did, to see. My assumption is this movie does not live up to the Long Kiss Goodnight in terms of volume of guns. You write a four million dollar script, you're going to put a lot of weapons in it. <laughs> <laughs> little $15 million one, you don't put quite as many. And this only has 13 different uh, weapons listed in it. Not a whole lot. There's, you know, Smith & Wesson. There's a, a Glock non-gun, a Magnum mini revolver, Vector, Remington, Ruger, uh, Colt, some Six Hours, uh, Beretta, Jericho. There's a, a variety of different things, 13 different things. Uh, totally, totally different than what we had in uh, in the last three. So this one uh, really falls as far as the, uh, the weaponry goes. Not uh, that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a lot of fun, and I love all the close-ups. I'm trying to remember which is the one that he uses that he keeps in his... Uh, in his crotch that he uh, shoots the guy with. That was the um, uh, the Magnum Mini Revolver, the NAA-22 Magnum Mini Revolver yep. with a 1 and 5 eighths inch barrel and black stocks. Right. <laughs> it only fires five <laughs> shots, and then you need to drop it for something better. Yes. <laughs> I like their website. It is used from a very unusual place late in the film. <laughs> <laughs> I love the line too. Wow. I was glad you had a gun in there for a second. I actually thought you could do that. Like it was some big gay thing. I'm so torn out. Like, is this, is this a character that, uh, that, uh, gay people are going to find really offensive or will they go, Oh, at least, you know, there's a gay, uh, a character in a crime, a crime story, a gay detective who's actually taken out criminals. Uh, I'm a little torn. (laughs) Yeah. I'm a little torn. I, uh, you know, uh, this is what, (laughs) It's one of those things. Uh, Val Kilmer, man. He's quality people. Yes. Just enjoy the fact that we've got a, a major gay character in the film, and he's played by Val Kilmer. There you go. Uh, how'd the film do, Andrew? Well, I already said that this film did not uh, get a lot of money to make. It was a hard one to get off the ground for these guys. Uh, it, it was released October 21st, 2005, a relatively small release. It didn't get a big push by Warner Brothers either. 
Um, and I think that was much to the chagrin of the people behind it. Um, it was just kind of a, just a little tiny release. I, I, I did see it theatrically. I, I knew it was coming and I was looking forward to it, but I kept talking to people about it and nobody knew that it was even out. They didn't even know what the movie was. So I think that speaks to uh, the way that Warner Brothers decided to release this thing. It did cost $15 million, which is about 17 and uh, three quarters million in today's dollars. Couldn't find anything on prints and advertising, but again, I don't think they spent a ton in uh, that realm. This film made domestically about, <laughs> interesting, only just over $4 million, which is what uh, Shane Black got paid for his <laughs> previous script, um, and uh, about... Twelve and a half million internationally. So all told, it made about sixteen point eight million, um, uh, which is about twenty million adjusted gross. So it did make some money back, assuming the print and advertising wasn't too much. But it only made about twenty one thousand per finished minute. So it's definitely on on the low end of the scale of the Shane Black films that we've talked about. This is at the bottom of our list. Um, Iron Man three, I would imagine, uh, went right up toward the top. That is uh, really disappointing for this film. I think it is a lot of fun. Uh, And uh, I think we should probably uh, rank it and prove it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and sign in. And then go ahead and search Kiss Kiss Bang. That's two kiss, two kiss, two bang. And then you'll find this film and you can do what you know you love to do is rank it filmo a filmo against the list of the other 230-some-odd films that we've talked about on this show. Here we go. Kiss Kiss versus... Well, you remember last week when we did Long Kiss Goodnight, yeah. it ended up pretty much right in the middle. Yeah, because um, of the it, Go Brother block. And it's and I'm a little disappointed by that. But here we now have uh, it standing as the block right in the middle. So we've got Kiss Kiss Bang Bang or the Long Kiss Goodnight. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. You know I love Long Kiss. I know you do. That one I really, really love. But Kiss Kiss Bang Bang I love more. Oh, so there you go. I'm, I am relieved at that. <laughs> uh, kiss Kiss Bang Bang or Boogie Nights? It's Kiss Kiss Bang Bang for me. You know I love me some Boogie Nights. I know, I know. I'm, I'm going to go Kiss Kiss on this one too. And it's interesting that uh, Shane Black... <laughs> painted himself I know. as Dirk Diggler. <laughs> as the Dirk Diggler. <laughs> and here we are comparing the two. All right, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang or National Lampoon's Vacation. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, hands down. I know it is for you. This is a, this is really hard. It's National Lampoon's Vacation. Mm. Yes, it is. Come on, Andy. I'm, I'll, let's just say, know. on substance alone, like you can enjoy National Lampoon's Vacation, but there's just more going on in this film. Oh, boy. I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, it's it's vacation. Sorry, exactly. folks. Parks closed. Moose out front should have told you. Uh-huh. Yeah. You're proving my point. Okay. I'm going to pull what you did last week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's do it. I'm going to I'm gonna go take you to the mat for vacation, but I, a glimmer of me hopes that you win. <laughs> All right. Allow me okay. to be that glimmer. Here we go. Glimmer. Right. <laughs> glimmer. I can't speak. Oh. Do it. One, One two, two, three, three rock. rock. <gasps> oh, there you All go. Right. One, One, two, two three, three, rock. rock. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One, One two, two, three, three paper. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. That was a doozy. All right. All right. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang, or Brazil. I'm no, sorry. I'm going Brazil. with Brazil. Yeah, it's Brazil. Yeah. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang, or my favorite year. Well, it's kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Yes, it is. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang, or delicatessen. Mm. 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 I'm doing kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Mm. As fun and creative as delicatessen is. Okay. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Or Snowpiercer. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Oh, wow. I really love Snowpiercer, but uh, yeah, I'm going to go kiss, kiss, bang, bang on this one. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Or Daniel Craig, James Bond, Casino Royale. Casino Royale. Yeah, I'm going Casino Royale. Mm-hmm. That's a, This was a really tough one. We had a lot of good matchups on this one. I know. Number 17. Wow. Check yeah. it out. Pretty Top impressive. 20. 
That is really impressive. You know, I'll tell Way you, just to go Shane Black. reflecting on Shane Black, though, I, when we first said that we were going to do a Shane Black series and starting with Lethal Weapon, which is a film that I do hold so close to my heart and ending on this one, I thought all of these films are going to be top 20 films. And I am I am really surprised on reflection that these others didn't hold up as well as my memory of them served. And I'm disappointed but I'm relieved that this one hit the top 20. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, give it a few more years, we can do another Shane Black series with uh, just films that he's been directing yeah. post this. And I think that would be a fun series to kind of look and see how the films that he's direct, directing and writing, uh, you know, kind of pair up with uh, what he's been doing here. Yeah, I, I really agree. And and I think so much of the lessons learned, sort of the key takeaways from this film is just how complex the, the whole industry is, because so much of the films that, you know, the things that didn't work in the films before is just how hard it is to get, you know, to get films made. It's an incredibly complex industry. And, and as a writer alone, having people mucking around with your work, it's frustrating. I I definitely uh, recommend anyone who is uh, interested in kind of reading up more on this and kind of the history of the the industry to read that Vanity Fair article in which they interview him. Just a yeah. really insightful article about where the industry was and, and how it got to where it is now. And that we've got linked in the show notes. So check it out. When the spec script was king. Yes, indeed. Good stuff. Where, uh, so what does that do for your letterboxed uh, uh, ranking here, Andy? This one's a four and a half. Me too. Yeah. Me too, straight Just up. Solid, solid stuff here. I mean, you know, I have a few little issues with it here and there, but for the most part, man, it's just so much fun to watch. Uh, okay, big week next week. Where do we go from here? Well, we're actually going to be having our uh, May film board this uh, weekend. We're going to be talking about Captain America Civil War, speaking of Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. Mm-hmm. Very much looking forward to that. And then the show will be continuing next week with Metropolis. We're jumping into our Fritz Lang series, in which we're going to be starting with Metropolis. Then we're going to talk about Spies, M, Manhunt, and ending with Ministry of Fear. So that's going to be a fun little series of some uh, dark Fritz Lang films. It's Metropolis. Is this our first silent film? This is going to be the first silent film we will have talked about on the show. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Now I'm curious. I'm excited about that. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a couple versions of it. I actually am going to try to watch both of them. The uh, the version that um, has recently been restored is like I think it's a two and a half hour version. Will be the the one that I'm I'm primarily going to watch. But I am very curious to watch the version that Giorgio Giorgio Moroder uh, released in 1984. Kind of the the rock version where he put a bunch of uh, rock songs in it and uh, and kind of colorized it a little bit and did some crazy stuff with it to try introducing it to a new audience. I'm really uh, curious about that. I've never seen that version, and so I'm uh, going to try to check both of them out before we uh, talk about it next week. That's good, and it seems, seems like with so much to watch that I should uh, I should probably go to bed. Well, you do that. I'm going to give my flight attendant friend a call. You remember her, my friend Flicka. Amazon doth giveth, Andy. Uh, there are more people who don't like this movie than I expected. More than any of the other Shane Black films, I feel, that Which we've talked about. Which is bizarre. It's a shame. Uh, Maybe we're just disconnected, but I don't, I don't think so. I think these people are disconnected. I'm going with these people being disconnected. I start with uh, our friend Joe, who watched this in just in 2014, uh, format Amazon video. And he says, it's not worth your time giving it one star. Once again, we selected a movie based on the actors and the story description, but we were sorely disappointed with the plot. The story starts out with a rambling narration about how some non-Hollywood type becomes a sought-after actor, then goes sideways into some other rambling narrations. After 20 minutes, the plot never got around to what was written as the main storyline, so we dumped it and went on to something else. So, here's the lesson learned here. Please, don't write a review if you don't watch the whole movie. (laughs) because <laughs> you know what this was not the only one this is but one uh, dipping into a, a a trough full of people who gave up on the movie after 15 or 20 minutes and that's really unfortunate just like the one i'm about to read <laughs> this is a one star 
uh, by Golf Man, who says, Aborted! I didn't even watch the complete movie. It was really, quote, stupid, as far as I was concerned. And the acting was subpar from two actors that I expected more from. I'm really not hard to please with most movies, but this one couldn't keep my interest at all. Just a shame. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. These people who write these reviews, uh, not having even finished watching the movie, it just, it always uh, baffles me. And I like it how they put stupid in quotes. (laughs) Right. It it was really, it was stupid. stupid. (laughs) What, how you say, how you say. (laughs) Oh, Amazon. Thank you. It is hard to believe we have been having in-depth conversations about movies since 2011. You are telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. Season 5 had some great adaptations, like our Meryl Streep Oscar-nominated performances series. We covered adaptations like Kramer vs. Kramer, Sophie's Choice, and The French Lieutenant's Woman. It's a real Sophie's Choice between those books. <laughs> you see what, I, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I don't think it's quite at the level of a real Sophie's Choice. We also did Snowpiercer for our Bong Joon-ho series, adapted from the French graphic novel Le Transpersonnage. Man, I love that movie. We had our two-part 1939 series that included adaptations like Gone with the Wind, Ninochka, The Women, and The Hound of the Baskervilles. A number of those 1939 movies, like Goodbye, Mr. Chips, also tied into our recent 1940 Academy Award Best Picture nominee series. Our naughty children horror series had creepy adaptations like The Bad Seed, Village of the Damned, The Innocents, and Children of the Corn. For our Hayao Miyazaki series, we talked about his take on Lupin the Third with The Castle of Cagliostro, plus his own The Wind Rises. Some great listener choice picks, too. Viridiana and The Great Escape. And for our David Mamet Wright series, The Verdict, The Untouchables, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Plus, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang from our Shane Black series adapted from Brett Halliday's novel, Bodies Are Where You Find Them. Dive into the sources for all of these at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book you buy helps support the show. Check out thenextreel.com slash originals today and find your next read.